Hi everyone and welcome back to Bear All, your true crime podcast where we talk about chilling true crime cases as well as unbelievable true stories. I'm your host Emily and today we are going to be talking about the love of a mother, what parents will go through to protect their children. You know, I know that my dad is very protective. If something were to happen to me, he'd be there in an instant. So today's um, true crime story is about the love of a mother who went and stalked her daughter's kidnappers and murderers. So we're going to be looking at um, the fiery passion of a grieving mother, this grieving mother being uh, Miriam Rodriguez. Some of my pronunciations might be wrong in this um, video, but I've used Google and also, you know, um, YouTube and stuff so that I try and pronounce these words properly as I get to them, you know, countries, um, towns, that kind of thing. So we're going to be talking about Miriam Rodriguez and her daughter Karen. Miriam Rodriguez and her family live in Tamaulipas, which runs up the Gulf Coast towards the south border of Texas. And it's like the, the border there. It's one of the most dangerous places to live because it's on the border. You know, you get drug cartels, you get um, just general violence because of gangs and drug cartels. Um, you know, there's a lot of drugs because of the drug cartels and the gangs. It's just not a very safe place to live. Now, I can't remember how many children Miriam has, but she has at least two daughters. One's Karen. Um, I can't remember the name of the other daughter, unfortunately. Dates vary for when Karen, Miriam's daughter, disappeared. Some say it's 2012, some say it's 2014. Those dates get mixed up a lot because it's to do with when she was found, when she was taken, when she was reported missing. But I'm going to stick with 2012 because that's the earliest date we've got. Basically, Karen disappeared without a trace from her home, just like in the front garden of her home in 2012. She was kidnapped outside of her home by the Los Satos cartel. Karen was held ransom for $77,000. And Miriam, being the worried mother that she was, paid the money. Now, I've worked in fraud. And the last thing you want to do is give these people money because they will demand more and demand more and demand more, which is what happened. And Miriam kept paying. Now, Karen was never returned, obviously, because of the story. Um, the disappearance and murder of Karen um, is just a very small part of this story we're talking more about her mother Miriam now Miriam did initially report this to the police but obviously where they're on the border between Mexico and Texas there's a lot of missing persons cases um and Miriam felt like Karen was just being swept under the rug lost in a sea of other missing people after waiting Miriam and also after waiting and Miriam begging the police to do something Bearing in mind, they knew who had taken her. We don't know why she knew who had taken her. We don't know if Karen had involvement with this specific cartel, but somehow Miriam knew that this specific cartel had taken her daughter, yet the police would do nothing. Now, this is where Mama turned kick-ass. She refused to be silenced, and she started to go undercover and do her own research. So Miriam would often post as, um, I think they're called pollsters, basically people that go around and do polls and surveys. And she would also, she would also pose as election officials, health workers, visiting these people, like she'd get a lead and then she'd use that lead to go to the next lead. And she weaseled her way into the drug cartels' families by pretending to be people, being undercover. So you think, you know, their mothers, sisters, daughters, grandmothers, best friends, um, church pastors, all that kind of thing. She would get as much information as she could and she would find out where these people were. Miriam spent, I think it was three or four years, searching down these criminals and getting them put behind bars. The police still weren't doing anything, but Miriam was going out on her own accord catching these criminals herself and getting them arrested by calling the police after she caught them. Bearing in mind, Karen, Miriam's daughter, was 
she was a woman. She she wasn't, you know, under the age of 18 or anything like that. So Miriam wasn't that young herself, really. You know, I think someone my age, so nearly 30. My mum's in her 60s, nearly. And I'm just thinking about this 60-year-old woman going undercover to try and find what out what happened to her daughter, try and find her daughter. Um, obviously, Miriam was aware that her daughter was, you know, very much dead by now. You know, it's a drug cartel. Drug cartels, when they take someone, they're synonymous with, you know, killing them and getting rid of the evidence. That's why Miriam was so desperate to catch these bad guys because she didn't want it happening to other people. She knew it was happening to other people because that's why the police couldn't handle Miriam and Karen's case. It's because there were just too many people missing. When Miriam was going undercover, she went to extremes. Think having a suitcase full of disguises. She'd cut her hair, she'd wear wigs, she'd, you know, wear uniforms, she'd wear different outfits. This woman was going full badass undercover to try and find out what happened to her daughter because the police weren't doing anything. You know, it was a case that one of these times, I think it was one of the last men that Miriam got, I could be wrong, all along the kind of Gulf Coast to the border, there's stalls, you know, for people to buy things, flowers, food, clothes, essentials, um, just think of like little market stalls. Now, like I said, Miriam had got in contact with multiple people, we their her way into their lives, finding out as much information as she could. And that's how she found out that one of the cartel members who used to be a florist had gone back to his old job. Now, as a florist, his shop was a stall near the border. So think of little Miriam getting this phone call to say, his stall is back up and running. You know, he's there now. Early in the morning, she runs out in her pyjamas. She runs out in her pyjamas, puts her trench coat over the top. She has a hat um, over her bright red hair because, like I said, she was dying, cutting her hair and stuff like that. Um, she put her loaded gun into her handbag because, as you do, you need a bit of protection not that I agree with guns, but in this kind of situation, I think, you know, dealing with drug cartel members, you need to protect yourself. By this point, Miriam had put so many members of this specific drug cartel behind bars that they knew who she was. They knew she was coming for them. So after putting her trench coat and baseball cap on, she headed straight for the border to find this florist. So dodging in and out the different vendors, um, you know, she knew she was looking for a florist only on this day he wasn't selling flowers he was selling sunglasses she got too close she got too excited he saw her you know at this point you'd think oh god she's gonna be shot or something no he saw her knew exactly who she was and ran and little miriam ran after him chased him this is when she wrestled him to the bars of like the border she literally wrestled this full-grown man in a drug cartel put his hands behind his back held the gun to his back and said if you move i will shoot you and got someone to call the police that's how badass miriam was so miriam did spend you know three good years capturing a lot of men that kidnapped and murdered her daughter um, like I said, they knew who she was. And so in those three years, Miriam had managed to capture nearly every living member of that cartel group that weren't already in jail. Even those of them that had tried to start a new life. You know, a born-again Christian, a car salesman, a taxi driver, um, and one even a babysitter. Now, I don't know the specifics um, on how they found these remains but Karen got wind of whenever they found someone's remains and Karen knew about where she went missing where those drug cartels would take people to murder them and dump the bodies um, and it said that Miriam 
was fairly sure it was her daughter's remains because there was this scarf that I think she or um, that Miriam or Karen's sister, so Miriam's other daughter, had given Karen. Um, now you're thinking a scarf, anyone can have a scarf. Um, so I don't know how that works. But the remains they did find, they were, I think, three ribs of a human body. These ribs were never processed. They were n- they never had DNA taken from them. And for the better part of a year, Miriam badgered the police to try and get them to do some kind of DNA analysis on these bones, you know, so she can get some kind of peace, try and lay her daughters to rest. Now, it took months and months for Miriam to finally get them to do a DNA testing of these remains. At this point, it was 2015, so you're looking at the three years since Karen's disappearance. The DNA on these bones were found to be Karen's. It took the police six months to test the bones. Six months. Bearing in mind, Miriam was fairly sure they were going to be Karen's. She badgered and badgered them. It took them six months to process these bones, take DNA from them. Um, And Miriam thought it was too much of a coincidence as well for it to be Karen's. Um, You know, it was just... Miriam thought it was too convenient for the bones to be Karen's, considering they only had three bones. She wanted to make sure that you know, her body was found, why they only found three bones and all that kind of stuff, open a proper investigation. Now, by this point, you've got to remember that the state had lied to Karen about multiple things. Um, They said they were going to help her and they didn't. Um, You know, they said they were going to test the bones and they didn't, which is why she had to keep badgering them. This is when Miriam decided to keep pushing. Miriam found out that she could send the bones that were found to a third party, which is basically what um, the police did. Um, So she sent the bones, she petitioned for the bones to be sent to another third party. And again, if this was Karen's body, we say body, it was three ribs they found. Where where was the rest of her body? That's what Miriam wanted to know. She knew that um, remains had been found in that area before. But again, if Miriam had to badger the police to test just three ribs those remains were probably still sitting in a box somewhere in 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 the evidence bags waiting to be tested which means they may have had Karen's body months or years prior but they hadn't tested them now what Miriam was told was The problem with this is that there's no centralised office for tracking where any prior remains had gone to, been sent to, or for tracking where and when the remains were collected. This meant that Miriam had to speak to each individual company. This meant Miriam had to reach out to each individual company and agency um, independently. So she spent her time writing letters and emails, badgering these people to find out what happened, if they had any remains from this specific area in these specific time frames. Miriam even attached the GPS coordinates of where the three rib bones were found and asked the different agencies were any remains collected from this specific area. It wasn't until Miriam sent a letter to the State Commission for Human Rights that anything happened. Now, this agency is a Mexican agency, um, and they act more on behalf of the human and civil rights of people, uh, you know, violations that might have happened um, with state agencies like the police. In her complaint, Miriam expressed her frustration of the government's, you know, lack of response um, to her pleas. And she also recounted every correspondence she had with, you know, these agencies, the government, the police, or really the the lack of uh, correspondence she had with them because she was doing all the talking and they were just trying to brush it under the rug out the way. 
Miriam demanded an inquiry. Now, I don't know what happened, but we can probably assume nothing happened because if something did happen, it would probably be in all the research I did on this case. By this point, the members that were left of the cartel, like I said, they knew exactly who Miriam were. The active members were after Miriam. She felt very paranoid about this. They knew the more that she pressed for an investigation into what happened, the more evidence they had, the more likely they were to be put behind bars because she knew who did this. You know, she had already caught, I think it was 12 to 15 of the members of this group um, and they were behind bars because of her work. Miriam installed bulletproof windows into her home and she asked for basically protection from the police because she knew things were bad. Now, she carried a gun with her at all times because she was paranoid, but sadly, this wasn't enough. On the 10th of May, 2017, it's Mother's Day in Mexico. You know, we're looking at five years after Karen had gone missing. Miriam had most of these members behind bars, but clearly not enough of them. Not that it's her job to do it. Now, this was also a day that there was a march arranged to protest and demand action for authorities, not just for Karen, but for missing people. The authorities weren't doing enough. Everyone was fed up with it, you know. Parents were dying and their children hadn't been found. You know, it's pe- children were growing up and they never knew what happened to their mum or their dad. Now, a lot of these people in her neighbourhood had gone to the march and there wasn't really anyone about. And as you can imagine, there would be authorities at the march to make sure there was nothing violent or anything like that going on. And on this day, Miriam was murdered. Gunmen broke into her home. I don't know how many, it doesn't really specify, but we know she was shot at least 12 times. Now, Miriam passed away on the way to the hospital. She didn't die instantly, but this case sparked outrage in the community. The people of Mexico were beyond devastated. Miriam had become a legend, you know, taking out these really dangerous members of a cartel gang for her daughter, for revenge. Well, I say revenge, she was avenging her daughter's death. People in their thousands marched in protest in tribute to Miriam. They they were furious, they were outraged, they were upset. They paid tribute to her courage, bravery, and her ultimately her sacrifice. She knew what she was doing when she started chasing these cartel members down. And I would imagine she didn't think she'd probably get as far as she did. You know, these were dangerous, dangerous criminals. Miriam had become a critic of the government. She'd become an ambassador of hope for other people who had lost family members. You know, Miriam was the face of the people that had lost their wives, daughters, husbands, sisters, brothers, cousins. You know, she was a face for those that had gone missing or murdered and had never been found or the government had done nothing about them going missing. Miriam had risked everything to fight for her daughter and she continued to fight for other families even after she stopped chasing the cartel members. Miriam even founded a group which have over 600 families searching for their loved ones that still have not been found and so Miriam's legacy lives on today. Now if you have been affected by anything I've spoken about in this video um, I will put some details down below if you are related to someone who's been murdered or you need any help I'm gonna put some links in the description box below um, you know don't give up hope never give up hope because sometimes hope is the only thing you have and you need that hope to keep going. You know, people like Miriam who are the face of the people and the voice of the people, we need more Miriams. You know, hundreds of people go missing every day along the Gulf Coast and along the border there and something needs to be done. So that concludes our podcast today. Like I said, I will put some links down below if you want to take a look at them. I'll also link um, the website to uh, the group that Miriam founded. 
Thank you for listening and I will see you again next time for your Beryl True Crime podcast.